Hey everybody, Nick here, and I am back for Ask the Nick number 10. Wow, that's a lot of Ask the Nick. Um, this is an ongoing section where I answer viewer questions. I try and answer every viewer question. Um, if it's been a little while since yours got answered, uh, feel free to either leave it again down there, or more likely what happened is that I'm waiting and I'm going to do a full video about it, because it's a really good question that requires an in-depth answer. But, you know, I'm limited by the amount of time I've got to spend, so, you know, I do my best for what I can. Uh, but anyways, if you got questions for the Nick, go ahead and leave them down there, and uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Although actually, first, let's back up for a second. Um, I want to put some special thanks out there, not only to the people who have loaned gear, who are regularly subscribing, but also to the people who are donating on the Patreon. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and that's given me a little bit of extra sort of income to uh, actually make some upgrades. I'm now using studio lighting, which is up there. I've upgraded my tripod, so things should be a little better. I'm using an actual background now. I'm really trying to class up the joint a little tiny bit, although at the end of the day, I'm still talking, so I can't get that classy, right? Anyways, but thanks to the Patreon supporters, as well as everybody else who's put an effort into making the channel great. Let's go ahead and jump into it. So one really common question that I get is, uh, Nick, how do you sharpen your knives? And I've actually discussed this before, but I use an Edge Pro unit. This is its little carrying case, and uh, it's a big, complex thing. I've uh, I got a video describing it, a full review of the Edge Pro system, and I like it a lot. It's improved a lot by adding some magnets, uh, as well as by uh, using a drill stop collar. But, you know, it's, it's a great little setup, and... Uh, I'm a big fan. I've looked into some of the other setups, but they've never really appealed to me enough to spend additional money on it. Uh, so that's how I sharpen my knives. Uh, the other question I get a lot is, will you make sharpening tutorials? And the answer there is probably no, because honestly, I can sharpen knives just fine. And in fact, you know, I, this is a Nick Shabazz edge right here. Um, it's kind of tough to show off an edge on a video, but nonetheless, I mean, I've put a lot of edges on a lot of knives, but I don't know that I am a great sharpener in the sense that some people are. Um, and so, you know, I figure I might as well stick to what I know and let you watch other people who are really, really good at sharpening rather than me who gets by just fine. So, uh, there you go. Good question, everybody. So Diadora9292 asks, Nick, what angle do you sharpen your knives at? Is it always the same for every knife? No, it's not. Actually, usually what I try to do is stick pretty close to the factory angle. And so the way that I do that is I put some Sharpie uh, permanent marker on the edge bevel for the knife. And uh, then I use the stone on the Edge Pro and I basically set the angle so it's about the factory angle, and then I make a couple of runs back and forth with the stone, and if it scrapes the Sharpie off cleanly, I'm at the right angle. If not, I can adjust. That said, sometimes I do actually change the angle a little bit. Some knives I've made a little bit more shallow. The uh, Spyderco Sleash Bowie is a knife where I've really widened out the bevel a little bit here, because I think it looks really excellent when you do it that way. So, um, that's kind of a neat little thing, and I also did it with the Spyderco Dragonfly. Uh, it's not necessarily something that's ideal, especially with some steels that tend to be a little chippier, but um, I, I'm certainly not opposed to changing the angle. The problem with doing that, though, is that it takes a long time, and especially on a modern steel, something like your M4, your VG, I'm sorry, your um, M390, VG10 is okay for that. It, it's, it's a process, and so I'd rather not change the angle if I have a choice in the matter at all. Good question there, Diadora. So Daniel Ward asks, what do you think of about different kinds of wrist straps and bracelets. What's your preferred style? Good question. For me personally, in order for me to really like a knife, it needs to be on a bracelet. Um, because, and that's for a few reasons. First off, a watch bracelet is completely waterproof. Water really just can't hurt it unless it, you know, you leave it under water for 15 years, whatever. It's not going to be a problem there. And it's also sweat proof as a result. Sweat's not going to soak through it. Um, this means you can wash the watch off no problem at all. If the watch gets covered in dirt, you just put it under the sink. Case closed. Problem solved. Bracelets are also really durable and they dry very quickly after you, uh, well, finish washing them. Unlike something like a canvas or a nylon or something like that. If I can't get a bracelet, that's probably a disqualifier for me for a watch. There have been many times where I've seen a great deal on a watch online and thought to myself, I'm going to do this, and then I realize they don't have the bracelet, and it's just like, oh, 
case closed. As if the deal isn't good enough to buy a bracelet with the price, eh, it's not a good deal. Um, but if I have to go there, I do like a NATO strap. It's a, This is actually a NATO strap I modified to snip off the little keeper thing, because I don't need that. But um, I like a good NATO strap. It's got a lot of the same characteristics. You can wash it out. It's waterproof. No problem there. The plastic straps bug the crap out of me, because you've got this extra flappy bit hanging around on the outside, and when you've got small wrists... Well, you know, it's very easy to have a lot of extra hanging out. So, not a big fan of that. And leather straps are just a, a no way for me. They're not even waterproof. They're, they're, they're just, I know that they look cool, but I would just really rather not. So, I'm either going metal or maybe nylon and plastic if I'm going real cheapy. But otherwise, metal's the choice for me. Hey, great question there, Daniel. So, my buddy Ian over at Tech and Tools asked, which would you rather have, a triple a size flashlight with the literal power of the sun or an adamantium three inch blade that can cut through blast doors um so honestly i'm going flashlight here assuming that the battery life is worth a damn on the power of the sunlight because honestly i don't have to cut through blast doors very often i you know i'm very happy to shop in a knife every so often adamantium hasn't really become an issue but i am always wishing that i had a little bit more power out of a flashlight and so that sounds pretty neat to me and if the battery life's really good or if it's got some magical fuel cell source in there always set it up in the basement with some solar panels make a little cash on the side great question there ian moving on so toad sticker asks um are your kitchen knives as expensive as your edc knives why or why not i've gotten a lot of questions about my kitchen knives um, the thing is, they're not that interesting. I don't have a strong passion for kitchen knives, mostly because I'm really bad in the kitchen. I don't really know what the heck I'm doing. I help out where I can, but, you know, that's not an area where I love spending my time. What I've got for kitchen knives are basically these four. I've got these two here, which are both by Northwoods Knives. Um... And they are actually, the steel is CTS XHP. And I like these knives a lot because they're easy to take care of. They do uh, rust a little bit here. You can see a couple of little spots. I need to address that one of these days with these guys. But anyways, I like these guys very much. They're, they're great little kitchen knives. And I had a store credit over with um, Knives Ship Free. And I chose to do it that way. I've got this guy here, which is a Henkel's. You can just barely see it anymore. But um, it's a decent enough knife. It's a Sentoku style. Um, it goes dull a little quicker than I'd like to see, but it, it works, and I've had it for a long time. I got it like a going out of business sale at some point in time. Decent enough deal. And then I got this guy in the back here as a bread knife. It's a Victorinox Fibrox uh, bread knife, and the Fibrox knives are actually, honestly, they're some of the best value in the kitchen knife world. Um, you know, I always get them for friends who are needing knives uh, because... You know, the, the steel's good, the handles are good. There's not a whole lot to object to there. It's a little on the soft side, but, um, and so is a bread knife. This is spectacular. And the serrations are big enough that I can go through and resharpen them with a shop maker blade every so often. So that's nice. And so this is actually our kitchen knife selection. You don't really need all the knives you get in the knife block. I hope that was interesting for you there, Toad Stalker. Thank you very much for the question. So Dwight Doucet asks, so what do you think about the Benchmade Gold Class? Well, I don't have any Benchmades or any Gold Classes, so this is gold colored. Figured it'd work for the camera, right? Um, the, the idea with the Benchmade Gold Class, for those of you not in the know, is that they take an existing Benchmade knife, like the 940, the Griptilian, whatever, and then they make a fancy version of it. And they use weird materials like, you know, C-Tech or, uh, you know, fancy titanium, or Damascus or Timascus, whatever. And they make a version of the knife that's, you know, the, the best that they can make it, at like six, seven hundred bucks. Um, and that's, that's a lot of money. But the thing is, it's a great tribute to some of Benchmade's more popular models. And that's really the way you gotta think about the Benchmade Gold Class, is that it's a knife that is fundamentally a tribute to one of Benchmade's major designs. And so that's where those make sense. If you are head over heels in love with your Griptilian, then you might think about a Gold Class Griptilian to celebrate that love. But it's not something that I feel like, you know, it's there's not great value there. There's not like great collectability unless you're a Benchmade collector specifically. You don't see them coming up at high prices on auction. They just, they've never made any sense to me. And frankly, at this point with Benchmade quality control being what it is, I, I'm not giving them anywhere near that amount of money for anything. I'd hope they'd do those well at least, but so they don't make sense to me. But if they do to you, hey, who am I to judge? Have fun. Good question, Dwight. 
So Real Bush Monkey asks, with what companies like ZT and Kaiser and Spyderco are doing these days, do you feel like the Chris Reeve Knives Sabenza is still worth the asking price? It's a good question. The Sabenza is an iconic frame lock flipper. I don't have one because honestly, it's not a knife I'm super in love with. I'm thinking about maybe picking one up to try a long-term review, who knows. But anyways, with the Micarta, so it might fit my hand better. But it's a knife that's pretty expensive. Looking at 350 no for the small version. Um, and that's, that's a good amount of money. And it's true that in the last maybe five, six years, 350 it goes a lot further in terms of that. And it's got some strong competition. Um, but I will say, though, that the, uh, the Chris Reeve knives, they do have some benefits just from being a Chris Reeve. You get a really great warranty. You get something that is made in the U.S. of A., which is kind of a beautiful thing. And you, you get just really excellent quality control. You're not going to get 11. But anyways, there are some knives that really compete well against the Sabenza. The Spyderco Sleash Bowie is one of them. I would put this knife up against the Sabenza any day of the week, both in terms of quality and smoothness and pretty much everything. I'm a big fan of this knife, and I think that at 300 bucks, it's a much better value than the Sabenza. ZT's got a bunch of stuff under 350 that's really good. It can be really high-end. The ZT oh, 456 is a good idea. I mean, and all of these knives are going to be in that price range and pretty excellent. And So, I don't know. I... 350 does feel a little high, and the, the world is getting really good at flipper frame locks, and given, I'm sorry, at titanium frame locks, and given Chris Reeve kind of started it, and you pay some money for history, but I think those need to come down a little bit, and the Encosi, which is kind of like a small Sabenza, is a smaller small Sabenza, is a really overpriced knife, so I don't know, I'd like to see some of the prices go down a little bit, but honestly, they don't have to at this point, so I don't see them going to. Um, if you can get a Sabenza used, that's the way to do it, though. You can see them for like 275 300 used any day of the week. And at 275 bucks, a Sabenza's a pretty good deal. And it's a good way to tell if it fits your hand if you can't actually go out to a store and handle one yourself. So I guess that's kind of where I land. Yeah, the price is a little high. Yeah, it could probably come down. I'd be a lot happier with a Sabenza at 300 bucks or even 325 to make up for the warranty. But uh, 350 is a little steep, and as you go up there... You keep going up there. Pylock, though, I feel is pretty much worth what they're asking. Maybe you could afford to be cheaper, too. Anyways, good question, Bush Monkey. Moving on. So Rich Cacone asks, uh, if you had to pick between Spyderco and ZT for the rest of your life, meaning you could only buy knives from one or the other for the rest of your life, you couldn't even handle or review the ones from the other side, which manufacturer would you pick? Um, actually, for me, that choice is pretty easy. I would go Spyderco. Now, there's nothing wrong with ZT. It's a great company. They're doing a lot of good things, and I would definitely miss it. But the simple fact is that the majority of what ZT makes, if you look at their website, are high-speed, low-drag sort of tactical knives. They tend to make knives that are huge, that are black DLC coated, and that are just, I don't know, they're not my style particularly. Whereas Spyderco honestly makes every damn thing. They make huge ridiculous knives. They make tiny ridiculous knives. They make tiny useful knives. I mean, they make a lot of really cool stuff. And so I feel like on a regular basis, when Spyderco announces new products, I'm really excited because there's probably going to be something good in there for me. When ZT drops something new, it's like, huh, well, maybe, maybe there will be something. But by and large, I'm not super enthused because... Most of it's not really for the Nick. So, like I said, for me, the choice is easy. I'm going Spyderco. This is all the Spyderco I've got at the moment, uh, not counting Lona's. This is all permanent collection stuff. And uh, this is the only ZD I've got in my permanent collection at the moment. The 562, great knife, but just wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting that much carry. So, yeah, I'm going Spyderco. Great company, but so is ZT. And, you know, I would definitely regret it. Luckily, life doesn't work that way. Good question, Rich. So Ian Hanna asks, have you ever jumped aboard the hype train for a knife? You know, for whatever reason, you see a knife and you knew you just had to have it the second you could get it, completely disregarding the reviews or anybody else's opinions. Yeah, a couple of times. Um, for me, the Graham Razel was like that. I remember seeing a razel-shaped blade on Knife Club and thinking to myself, oh my God, do I want that. That is incredible, it's unique, and I need, I need, I need. And I saw the price at the time, and that 
kind of went out the, the, the door because I was still working in school and whatnot. But nonetheless, the moment I was actually able to get one, I, I did. And I'm really glad I did because it's a hell of a knife. Um, The Sleesh Bowie was another knife like that. I remember standing in a hallway looking at some, maybe Reddit or something. Somebody posted up a uh, picture of this new upcoming model from Spyderco. I was like, holy crap, yes. And so I, I ended up getting one the week they came out, although I got it used, which was incredible. Um, so that was nice. I'm currently on the hype train for the Grimsmo Rask, uh, which is the follow-up to the Norseman. Uh, should be a great knife, but uh, they're, they're coming out slowly. I know they're working a lot on the tooling, just got a new lathe and whatnot. But um, nonetheless, the Rask is supposed to be really great just because it's made by the same people who made this, which is my favorite knife. It's incredible. But uh, right now, most of what the world has about the Rask is hype. Hopefully more of them are going to be filtering out to the world, and hopefully my pre-order is going to show up one of these days. But uh, we'll see. I was on the hype train for the ZT456. I saw that knife. I thought it was a lot smaller at the time, but uh, it was it's a really pretty knife, so I went there. I am currently on the hype train for the Spyderco Ouroboros, which is a really interesting knife. Um, it kind of nests back into itself in a cool way. So I got that guy pre-ordered. I've also got the Reinhold Rhino, which is a small compression lock knife pre-ordered, as well as the Peter Carey Magnitude, um, because I love the Rubicon, and I think this might be an even better option for EDC, and hopefully they've got the same degree of fit and finish, because the, the Rubicon was pretty incredible. But uh, yeah, so I've definitely been on the hype train, and I'll be there, but I'll be there again. The only thing I'll say is just be careful with the hype train because it's very, very easy for you not to miss, not to see something that's kind of important. Like, you know, with the ZT, oh my God, it's six ounces? Really? Or, you know, so make sure and try and use a little bit of logic with your hype. Or if you're like me, you're going to end up getting burned. That's life, though. Great question there, Ian. So Richard Kane asks, I was on Instagram, I saw a company that makes knives completely out of carbon fiber or fiberglass, and you also see ceramic, titanium, whatever. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. My generalized thought is that carbon fiber is great for the body of a knife or for the scales or something like that. But in terms of the blade, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, sure, you can make a knife out of carbon fiber. You can make a knife out of fiberglass or out of ceramic and things like that. And sure, it'll be sharp for a couple of cuts, no doubt. Ceramic will do a little longer. But you get all kinds of compromises. It's hard to sharpen ceramic without diamonds. Carbon fiber, I don't even know if you can sharpen it. And if you could, you'd be releasing carbon fiber dust, and that's terrible. You get poor toughness. You get all kinds of issues, and I just don't see the point in it. Steel is such a wonderful damn material that... Uh, just just stick to steel. You know, you're not getting anything better out of the other approaches. So, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I guess that's my overall feelings, though. Good question, Richard. So, Kevin Wickwire asks, I know you travel for your job. Have you ever been someplace you wanted to return to or that you thought you could live there? Well, here are my travel knives, Spyderco Rhodey, Dragonfly, and um, Ontario Rat Number 2. Um, by the way, reprofiled edge, different angle than the factory. Anyways, moving along. Um, yeah, uh, but I want to make it clear. I don't travel all that much. Um, maybe I give the wrong impression. I, you know, I maybe travel once, twice a year. Uh, more than that lately. But, you know, I, I don't love it. I, I would much rather stay at home. I'm, I'm not one of those, oh, you got to see the world kind of folks. I've had my adventures. I'm done. I'm good. Thank you. So, um, but life demands it. So I travel. Some places that I'd like to go back to, South Africa is actually pretty interesting. There's a lot of sadness there. There's a lot of inequality and a lot of struggle. But at the same time, it's also a place of great beauty, and it's a place of great effort. And I respect that a lot. So I'd like to get back to South Africa, maybe. Someday, check out Cape Town. I hear it's really pretty. Never got that far south. Um, Northern Michigan. I'm in Southern Michigan. Not so far from the uh, Detroit area. And the northern Michigan seems pretty nice. There's a lot of good there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I like the forest. I like the water. The, the trees. Holy crap, the trees. They're everywhere. That's kind of neat. Um, I'm also a big fan of the Rocky Mountains. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time in Denver, which is, seems a pretty great city. Um, at the moment, it smells a lot like weed, but I'm hoping they get, you know, moved on to the edibles here one of these days. Uh, but nonetheless, it's near Spydeco's factory store, so it's got that going for it, and it's got a whole bunch of really beautiful areas, uh, like the Rocky Mountain National Park. Holy crap, that's pretty. So um, uh, that whole area is 
nice, although apparently really expensive these days. Um, Salt Lake City is another city that's very pretty. There's a, there's a lot of real beauty around there, looking around. Uh, culturally, I'm not 100% on board, but um, at the same time, it's an area that I can see myself, at least geographically, living. Uh, that's nice. And then finally, Montana. There's an appeal to me. I've been up there a few times. Um, and like Missoula is a really pretty city. Bozeman seems kind of cool too. Um, I'm a fan of that whole aesthetic, the rural big sky thing. It's it's just gorgeous to me. And so I sure wouldn't mind spending more time up that neck of the woods. And if I happen to end up there in the uh, grand path of life, I probably wouldn't object whatsoever. Uh, especially like Glacier National Park. Holy crap, is that area incredible. Anyways, but then again, I was there in summer. Who knows? Maybe it'd freeze me out in the wintertime. Uh, so yeah, that that's a good question there, Kevin. Hope that was interesting. Moving along. So Matt SXC asks, can you do a backflip? Okay, sure. Hold on. All righty. There you go. Hope you enjoyed it there, Matt. Oh, okay. In all seriousness, no, I'm not very, I'm not very good at that. If I'm upside down, something has gone badly wrong in my life, and uh, I'm working on it. I'm I'm trying to get a little bit more athletic, doing um, working on some maybe some martial arts, something like that. But uh, by and large, no. If I've done a backflip, it's very icy, and I'm about to have a really bad time. Good question, though. Moving on. Okay, Nolan Carpenter asks: We know you love knives and gear, but what other hobbies do you have? Uh, reading movies, video games? Uh, good question. Used to be a big video gamer, um, but nowadays I just feel too guilty when I do it. Um, but I, I lost years of my life to Diablo, Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, not so much anymore. I do a lot of reading for work, so I don't do it so much at home. Um, but I do love, for instance, going out in nature, walking around. I'm a bit of a bird watcher, a bit of a small mammal watcher. Squirrels are excellent. Let's just be real here. Um, and, you know, I love national parks. I love the great outdoors. My One of my goals is to go to all the U.S. national parks in my lifetime. I got 13 out of 59 now. Not so bad. And so that's kind of neat. Um, let's see here. I'm also a big computer geek, so I, I love open source software. I love making weird, efficient workflows work out. Um, and I do enjoy watching TV with the fiancé. We've been going through a whole bunch of different shows on the Hulu and the HBO and the, the, the Netflix. And, you know, the, the Sopranos, The Wire is a great show. Uh, right now doing Mad Men again. Um, you know, pretty excellent stuff. Um... So that's, those are kind of, I guess, how I spend my time. But honestly, doing this review is probably my biggest hobby at this point. Uh, well, not this particular one, but all of them in general, because I love gear. And uh, it brings me joy to talk about gear and to share and to help people out here in doing it. Great question, Nolan. Moving on. So Mike R. asks, what knife or gear would you be most proud to pass on to the next generation? Honestly, that's not a question I've ever thought about because I've always known that I wasn't going to have a next generation. Um, the fiancé and I, have we both feel like we don't want to have kids. We're cleaning out the gene pool a little bit, you know. Um, but in terms of proud, what gear am I most proud of? I'm not really proud of individual ownership. That doesn't make all that much sense. That's just having money, and that can be work or luck. Um, but I can be proud of my curation. The fact that I can put these six knives on a table in front of me is kind of neat because I think each one of these represents an interesting high point in knife design and I think each one of them is really really excellent and so I'm proud of my collection although I'm not necessarily proud of you know owning that or this or something like that 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 doesn't make so much sense to me um so you know I'm really proud of the collection I've built and that I'm continuing to build it's you know who knows what's going to stick around in three weeks three months three years 30 years but uh you know who, who knows maybe in 40 years, so whenever I see the writing on the wall, somebody's going to win one heck of a giveaway on the Blade Forums. Who knows? We'll figure it out. But uh, And I am very proud, by the way, of my collection of videos. Um, maybe I'm just being a jerk there, but I am really proud of what I've been able to accomplish here, and I appreciate all the support that it's taken to get me here. So thank you guys for allowing me to develop some pride in this particular bit of work. 
So Frank writes, asks, uh, have you ever been appro uh, approached by a knife maker to collaborate on a design, or have you ever approached one of them? Uh, no, the closest I've come is I worked with Anthony Griffin on a custom knife, and I'll be working with um, uh, Jason Smock for a custom Smock knife. But um, I'd really like to do more consulting, maybe talk with a designer. If you're a designer and you want to get the Shabazz involved, let me know. But uh, so far, hasn't happened. And also, to be real, I'm not a knife maker. I'm just a reviewer. I'm just a critic. So, you know, if you want me to sit down and draw a knife on paper, I can do it, but it's not going to be inspired. I'm, my, I, my joy is in the details, not the grand creative process. But good question, Frank. So Jimmy Gray asks, are there any niches in the knife market or industry that you feel aren't really being filled right now? Um, and Jimmy, you also asked about advice for new knife makers. I'm going to try and make another video dealing with that when I get a chance. But anyways, in terms of niches, there are a couple of things I can see that you can do that would really help you stand out from the pack. First is to be unique. And I don't necessarily mean in design, but I mean in engineering. The Smock SK23 is a unique knife. It's got this rear-based flipper. It's got a button lock compression lock. It's got a Warncliffe blade. Oh, there. Um, you know, it's a really excellent, really unique knife, and that's pretty neat. And that makes somebody like me stand up and take notice. It's not just another slab sided titanium blasted free, uh, flip a frame lock. And so uniqueness is a beautiful thing. And I think that's something you can look at. And that's a way to carve your niche is to do something new and different. The tie lock's another great example of a unique knife. Um, Another, knife, another niche are knives that are really built to cut. This is a Spyderco Nilaka um, that I got in for review, thanks to my buddy Eric. And um, it's a great knife. And one of the reasons it's great is that uh, it's a really excellent cutting tool. It is, uh, you know, the geometry is such that it is really effective at slicing things. And it sounds silly that to say that a lot of knives these days aren't being made to cut, but it's kind of true. A lot of these hard-use blades are not meant as slicing tools. They're meant to be, you know... Uh, something very different. And so people who are making knives that are really excellent slicing cutting tools are kind of cool and unique and different. So maybe think about going that route. Then finally, the biggest niche that's unfilled are the small blades. Your high quality blades that come in under like three inches. Um, because, you know, right now there are a lot of uh, short knives, but not many really good customs or high-end or mid-tech sorts of three-inch blades. Knives that you can be in love with, but still make sense in big cities. Uh, knives that are just as stellar on the review table as they are in the lunchroom at a scared office. That would be a beautiful thing. There are very few people making three-inch custom knives or even three-inch really high-end production mid-techs. And I think that would be a wonderful place for you to walk into. I mean, people in Chicago and New York need high-end knives too. And so I'd love to see more attention paid to the small knives in the high-end. So those are three niches, the really unique, the really good slices, and the fairly small that I think need a lot more joy and a lot more attention from the knife-making world. Good question. So Toad Sticker asks, what do you enjoy least and most about the knife and EDC community? For me, on the least side, it's going to be the mall ninjas, the violence monkeys, the internet tough guys, the people who are obsessed with armed self-defense. They bug the crap out of me, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we need to have the kumbaya, everything's going to be okay, you don't have to think about violence because it doesn't happen sort of people. That's, that's not what I'm saying here. It's a good idea to think about it, to have some situational awareness, to be ready for war. But there's a difference between if you want peace, prepare for war, and the people who just want the war. The people who are just itching for self-defense. These are the kinds of people where you put up a review on the Spyderco Roadie and they comment about, oh, well, you know, the best way to get that in through the neck to remember, inflict a lethal injury is by this thing. And it's like, come on, buddy. Really? Did you go there? Did you have to go there? These are the people who post an EDC post and it's got like four brass knuckles, three handguns, two knives, a fair Bon Sykes dagger in the boot, a Kubaton, and for some reason a Sharpie that's got a jagged metal spike in it. Come on, really? And these are the people who, you know, you'll just see them in the forums. You know, somebody talks about somebody cutting in line at the bank, and you get, well, if he tried that crap, he'd have my Emerson at his throat faster than you can say lawful self-defense. These people drive me nuts because they've got this unrealistic and fear-based worldview, and they don't even realize it. And it, it's, it's terrible because they've romanticized some really ugly stuff, these really ugly situations, and they completely neglect to think about the rest of it. These are the folks who have all of these fantasies about saving the day through violent self-defense, but they don't realize that 
even if you defend yourself for two seconds in public, you're going to spend two years defending yourself in a courtroom after that. They completely neglect that idea. And, you know, it's just, it's a very, very ugly mindset. And they also spout that information because they're so convinced of their tactical superiority. And they tend to be kind of a, you know, tools as talismans approach. You know, oh, well, as long as you got a gun, you're going to be okay. You don't need training. That kind of drives me up the wall. Because the decisions aren't in logic, but it's in fear or often in hate. And so those are the kinds of folks that make the knife and the EDC community look bad. They're the kinds of people who make it very tough for people to believe that these are just tools to me. Yeah, you can stab somebody if you need to, but I hope to God I never need to. And those are the folks, uh, those are the reasons why a lot of the knife laws out there are out there. So I really wish that those folks would calm it down and realize that, yeah, the world's crappy, but it's not that crappy. You can calm it down a little bit, use a little situational awareness, and then, hey, smile. Go to the beach or something. Oh, hey, little rant slipped out there. What do I like most? So what I like most is the sense of desire to help others that I see in the knife community. There are some great communities out there. Knife Club on Reddit's great. Blade Forums can be pretty great. There's some really good Facebook groups and Instagram and things like that. But there's a strong desire to help that I keep sensing out there. Um, people want to support large makers and small makers. People really want to help out these companies, these people, things like that. Um, people really want to take care of new people coming into the hobby, is my impression. You get a lot of recommendations that are really well done, well thought out. You get a lot of advice. People will even send gifts to brand new members, you know, like, oh, you know what? Here, I'm not using this. You should have this. Things like that. And there's a lot of help at identifying the frauds and the scammers. It's, um, people tend to watch out for one another. I benefited from this too. Um, there are folks out there who are so nice and want to help so much that they send knives to random jackasses on YouTube. Yeah. I'm super grateful for this aspect of the community, personally. You also see things like fundraisers and giveaways for folks who are in a bad position. You know, uh, dealing with floods and medical issues, things like that. That's a beautiful thing, and I see a lot of that. But the thing that maybe makes me most happy about being involved here is the amount of care I see for folks outside the knife and EDC community. Oftentimes, when people are talking, especially in terms of EDC, they're talking about being there for the people who are not as prepared. When you talk about having a first aid kit, a lot of times people are thinking about, oh, maybe I should have this for somebody who isn't me. There's a lot of thinking about how to help other people. Um, and, you know, in my experience, folks are never happier than when they're talking about how they were able to help somebody out of a jam using their EDC, using their pocket knife, using their flashlight, whatever. Um, that's really what a lot of people, what seems to bring a lot of joy to people is being able to actually help another human being. And so above all else, this community, the knife, the EDC community, seems to have a sincere desire to help other people. And that really brings me joy, and it makes me feel like, damn it, this is something I want to do. And honestly, that's why I run this channel. That's why I dedicate large parts of you know, my time to doing this. Not because I'm going to make money off of it, but because the knife community and the EDC community has been great to me, and I want to see if I can be great back and help everybody else sort some of the junk from the gems, etc. Um, anyways, that's Ask the Nick, Volume 10. If you got any questions for future versions, go ahead and leave a comment down there. Feel free to check the other videos first to make sure there's not a duplicate. But uh, I hope this has been interesting for you. And, uh, hey, go help somebody and have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day while you do it. Bye now.